Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the Elkite and in the congregation. Great are the works of God of the Lord, studied by those who have pleasure in them. Full of honor and majesty are the works of the Lord, whose righteousness endures forever. Whose cause is wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord provides food for the faithful and is ever mindful of his presence. The Lord has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of the Lord's hand are faithful and just. The precepts of the Lord are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. The Lord sent redemption to his people, and he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and wondrous is God's name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever. Amen.
food sacrifice to idols. Now about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there were so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet, for us, there's but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom, all, for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we, we, live, we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as, as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat. We are no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become weak and a stumbling block to the weak. For any, anyone with a weak conscience sees you who, are, who have knowledge of eating the idol and the idol's couple. Won't he be emboldened to eat what he has been, sac has been sacrificed to idols? So this, so this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Amen. Dear Lord, may all of our thoughts and our feelings and meditations of our minds and of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We're kind of rolling along in this theme, and one of the many tasks and opportunities before us as a community becoming the people of God is discernment. As the community meets together for worship and fellowship and for learning, they also are, call, are listening for the call of God who will be working within certain individuals to cultivate gifts and inclinations that will lead them into certain roles within the life of the church. As Paul wrote, some are gifted to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. These roles are the roles that the church needs. And more than that, they're the roles that God has de determined are necessary for the church to fulfill its mission. And we continue, we continue to focus on listening for God's voice, getting closer to God, and discerning the gifts that we've been given by God. Well, Paul was talking about food, so that's the recipe for Christian living. What brings us closer to God? not our IQs. This idea is closely aligned with, with the above, but there, there's a different nuance. You ever notice how stupid smart people can be sometimes? Talking about the Bernie Madoffs of the world, people highly trained in their professions who lie, cheat, thieve, and, and murder. These people are smart. So why do so many mess up in spectacular ways, self-destructive ways? Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, Will Smith at the Oscars, Felicity Huffman and Lori Loughlin and the college admissions scandal, Princess Andrew and Harry, 
Josie Simlet, Matt Lauer, Lance Armstrong, Bill Clinton. The list, oh my goodness, the list would go on and on. Why do they, really, all of us, do the things that we do? The list of explanations begins with pride and arrogance. The Apostle Paul uses the expression puffed up. Isn't that a good word? Literally inflated. Like a needle that's been inserted into one's head and pumped and inflated to one's sense of importance. You know, it's not looking like a bobblehead. <laughs> Until our ego is larger than our brain. When this happens, people do really dumb things and often think dumb thing, things. And we know it's true. We're proud people. And we think, well, maybe we won't get caught. No one will ever notice that we're, we're smarter than the law. Our colleagues, our friends, or might even out think God. In the Bible, think of smart people like Jacob, Moses, David, Jonah. To be a long list again. They all made bad choices. And God has a preferential option for the poor, not for the proud and arrogant. You know, seminaries award a master's of divinity degree. But you know, that only gives students tools and disciplines to grow closer to God. We reach divinity in our relationship with God. You know, when Paul speaks of knowledge that, that puffs up, you know, he is likely speaking about Gnosticism. The Greek word Gnosis is where Gnosticism comes from. Gnosticism which has plagued Christianity since the ink of the scriptures was dry, teaches, among other things, that if we possess secret or esoteric knowledge, we hold the keys to salvation and we get it and, and others don't. Huh. Isn't that what fuels our pride? What brings us closer to God. Not our wealth. You know, this is, this is a, a no-brainer. God doesn't care about the size of your bank accounts. Really? I mean, there's some prosperity preachers who might not get that. But really doesn't. God simply is not impressed. Jesus famously noted that it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he added, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for someone rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, you know, most of us live on the edge of enough. But if we have more than enough, we might be less likely to nurture a deep relationship with God. Or at least Jesus seems to think so. For one thing, we, we become happy with our personal comforts. We're at ease in Zion and enjoy lying in the beds of ivory and lounging on our couches and dining on beef and lamb. Oh, that's the indictments from the prophet Amos. We're comfortable. And we really don't want to be discomforted. We're content with no particular desire for movement towards God or away from God. We're happy where we are and where God is. That is, just leave us alone. What brings us closer to God? Not our religiosity. The Apostle says in the love chapter, you know, Corinthians 13, you know, a few chapters down the road, that as far as God is concerned, 
It doesn't matter if we speak in the tongues of mortals or angels or if we have prophetic powers or if we have faith as to remove mountains or if we give away all our possessions. God is still not impressed. Don't we love grand gestures? Oh, there's something about smug self-righteousness that we love. Like the proud Pharisees boasting about his religiosity, his piety, that, that he needed others to see. There's a coolness about being seen as someone spiritually deep and centered. But Jesus didn't think religiosity was cool. Instead, he was, as someone has noted, the most anti-religious founder of all the religions that have ever been founded. Well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> the most anti-religious founder of all the religions that have been founded. He had little sympathy for the Pharisees with all their fringes and tassels. So if you're thinking that God is impressed with your church attendance and offerings, well, you know, they're good things to be sure. Then think again. We carry our Bibles to church and offer to be liturgists and read the scriptures during worship. We can teach Bible classes. We can even go to seminary and become ordained preachers. Or, or this clinches it. We can don t-shirts that, that proclaim, I've read the final chapter. God wins. <laughs> or Jesus strong. Or love God, bro. I love my sermonator t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's not enough. So what will bring us closer to God? Actionable love. Or uh, another way to answer is doing love. Paul says that although knowledge puffs up, What's the second part of that? Love builds up. The, the first image is that of a bicycle pump inflating a tire until it explodes. The second image it is a carpenter building something beautifully, beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. The word is agape. This is building love. This is love that acts, does something. This is love that looks out for the other person. For Paul, this means that although he has no problem eating food offered to Aphrodite in the, in the temple of uh, Acrocorinth, he will not eat such food in the presence of those whose conscience might be weakened. His liberty is a license. And Paul is careful to use his liberty in a way that builds, not destroys. For him, there's a nexus of liberty and love. And it's perhaps the most powerful linkage in human experience. The late Ernest Gordon he was a Scottish World War II veteran, served for many years as Dean of the Chapel at Princeton University. And before he became a minister, he served as an officer in the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. He was captured by the Japanese and spent three years in brutal POW camp in Thailand. In a wartime memoir, through the Valley of Kwai. Gordon tells a powerful story of how love changed hearts and minds. 
The Japanese force Gordon and his fellow POWs to build a railroad through the jungle. It, it was a slave labor project. You probably remember dramatized by Alec Guinness in the film The Bridge on the River Kwai. Conditions in the PO camp degenerated into barbarous brutality. The guards beat the prisoners, and the prisoners tried to beat each other out of food and water and parachutes. Anything of necessity was in short supply. It happened one day that a shovel was missing. And the Japanese officer in charge of the work detail was enraged. He demanded to know who had lost the shovel. When nobody in the unit budged, the officer pulled out the gun and he threatened to shoot every one of them. And it was obvious. It was obvious the officer meant business. And at that moment, one man stepped forward. Well, the officer put his gun away and took a shovel and just beat that poor guy to death. The survivors picked up the man's mangled horse and, and, and carried it away, and then they had a second tool check. Well, this time there was no shovel missing. It, it had all been a mistake. It had been a miscount in the first tool check. And the word spread like wildfire throughout the camp. An innocent man had been willing to die to save others. And the incident had a profound effect. From that day forward, the men began to treat one another like brothers. And when the victorious allies finally swept in, the survivors, human skeletons, lined up in front of their captors. But instead of attacking them, they insisted. No more hatred, no more killing. Now what we need is forgiveness. That's the awesome power of love at work. Mature, self-sacrificing love. Love builds up. You know, I would argue that the lesson learned in prisoner of war camp, a powerful lesson in actionable love, bound Ernest Gordon closer to God than any of his learning, degrees, or positions. All right, just to conclude, imagine Paul going further in his lesson about eating, using a recipe for baking to explain how do we grow closer to God. So if you want a recipe for divinity, then you'll need ample quantities of the flour of agape love, more than a cup or two of the milk of human kindness, seasoned with mercy, forgiveness, gentleness, generosity, and peacefulness. It is a recipe that warms the heart of God. It is the love that brings us closer to God. It's simply divine. Pure divine.